um, on the recording side, as we just started. Thank you for joining us. And um, we are thrilled to be here in, um, with Rabbi Lauren Berman, Building Yourself One Trade at a Time, a 10 part, 10 part spiritual journey into Musar, session five of 10. Um, you'll forgive me, I'm gonna turn my video off for part because I'm gonna eat my lunch soup now, but um, I am here with you all and, and we'll be back visually. Rabbi Berman, thank you for being here. Of course, thank you. Thank you for having me once again, everybody. Good to see you. So many familiar faces and familiar ears. Um, thank you, it's good to be here. Um, here we are, just about halfway through our 10-part series. And in light of last week's really tragic events that took place on Lagba Omer, I'd like us to learn um, in their memories um, Lagba Omer has traditionally been a day of celebration, specifically because um, it is a day when a lethal plague had stopped. It's associated with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's death. Um, but before this tradition took hold, Rabbi Akiva's students, the sage Rabbi Akiva, he had 12,000 pairs of students, 12,000 chavrutas, and they had succumbed to this really painful infectious respiratory illness. If you go back last into last year's Divrei Torah um, of all the rabbis, I'm sure they've spoken about this. Um, on Lagba Omer though, that plague actually stopped uh, or at least paused for that one day. And the reason the Talmud gives for this terrible, terrible situation was as a punishment that the students did not accord one another with honor. And for that reason, instead of learning about kindness, compassion, chesed, and rachamim, which I said we would do this week during last session, I'd like us instead today to focus on honor or kavod, um, the honor that we show others, the honor we show the Torah, and the honor that we show ourselves. After the plague, Rabbi Akiva did not give up. He recruited five new students, of whom Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was one of them. And they helped to continue Rabbi Akiva's lessons of ve'ahavta l'recha kamocha, zekla gadol b'torah, that um, that, that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. That's what the Torah says. And this is actually the fundamental principle, according to Rabbi Akiva, that loving our neighbors ourselves. Um, that's the fundamental principle. And Rabbi Akiva himself started uh, his journey into Torah study very late and learning a new language, changing one's whole lifestyle at age 40, according to some traditions, can't be very easy. Uh, then he garners all, all of a sudden, you know, thousands of students and then they all die. Can you imagine? all those eulogies, all the Shiva visits. And in a time of plague, right, as we all know now, probably some very lonely, lonely funerals, lonely Shivas. Rabbi Kiva had seen some struggles in his days, but he carried on and he recruited these five new students. He demonstrated resilience in the face of failure and uphill battles. And I hope that learning the Midah of honor today, the, the Midah that Rabbi Kiva's own students weren't fully able to embody Hope that that can help us as all Midot are meant to do to bring us closer to one another and help us feel more resilient in the process. Let's begin uh, as we have done um, through our, throughout our time together with a brief review. I hope these review moments are helpful and they help remind us uh, of what we've done and what work we, we all still have to do. We started with Hitlam Du, the beginner's mindset, always seeking out opportunities to learn even in the hardest moments for the most difficult of people. I'm going to share my screen with you. In the most difficult of people, you can see you can see my screen, okay? Let's see here. Yes, you're good to go. Amazing, um, right? And we, we we mentioned not learning something negative, but rather seeking something positive to always see ourselves as practicing. When we succeed in something, that's great. Keep practicing. Um, just like you know, we exercise. It's not like we get to our goal, we hit our our goal, and then we just stop, and then we assume our bodies are going to stay that way. No, we have to keep practicing. And when we don't succeed, that's okay. We're still practicing. The mindset of practicing and learning, that's Heat Lamdut. We learned about anava, often translated as humility, confidently recognizing our strengths and abilities and living those out in the world while acknowledging that they are gifts and not to be taken for granted. Humility or anava is the sense, not the sense that I am nothing, right? It's the sense that I am something, I'm something special, but not that I'm the most special. Some of us might need more humility, right? We need to get off our high horses. And some of us need a little bit less. We should step up. We should own our strengths. We should speak up. Then we got, we turned to gratitude. We discussed the three steps, three steps or stages of gratitude on which each of us might find ourselves in a different place. First was acknowledging the good 
that already exists, hakarat hatov, literally seeing the good, recognizing the good. When we talk about making gratitude lists, that's hakarat hatov, literally just seeing the good, taking note of it. And second was expressing hoda'a uh, or, or thanks, praise, thanks. Um, offering thanks is sometimes easier when things are going well, though sometimes it's also more difficult because we take things for granted when they're so common. When things aren't going well, it may be easier to express thanks because little hints of goodness may feel like they have a magnified effect, but it may also be difficult because it might be overshadowed by all the tough things in life. And like our matriarch, Leah, Leah, right, we're, who, we, who's, whose child Yehuda were named after Judah, we are challenged to express thanks in all situations despite the many real obstacles. And third, the third stage was chesed, doing acts of loving kindness to inject more good into the world. Gratitude is not simply an internal state. True gratitude flows outward. It makes me want to give back. And when I give back, it restarts the cycle of good things to be grateful for. And last week, we looked at Zrizut, which is a midah oriented towards getting us to take action, to materialize our plans and, and actualize the potentials within us. We saw texts that suggested that thinking and having good intentions is not enough. We need to act. And from acting, good intentions will follow. Thoughts without materializing those thoughts is, is as good as a, as a world that's in potential, but, has not, but not having yet been created. It's as if God has hired us in this life and we're on the clock, but unless we fulfill our job description, what good are we doing? God hired us. God wants us to, take, to help take, take, you know, to, to play a part in this world. And because God loves us and trusts us to do the job, God doesn't want our unique skills and abilities to go to waste. We specifically broke down this result into three different components the physical, the cognitive, and the emotional. The physical consists of actually doing the action. The cognitive is about us staying focused and going through the task at hand and then and focusing just on that one. And then the emotional is not just feeling that it's, it's not the feeling that it's a, it's a task, quote unquote, right? That needs to get checked off a list. But in general, um, certainly in the case of a mitzvah, something we want to do, something we feel enthusiastic about doing. Of course, we're not going to hit all three of those in every action we do, but it's something to keep in mind. Just to note, we uh, had a nice conversation last week at the end of our time about some of the struggles related to, to Zrizu. What happens when I feel like I have more of it than my partner? What happens when I, I have more of it than my community? What happens when all my friends, when all my days feel the same and I'm not okay with that? And it's hard for me to actually change things up. It just feels so bleh. Right. For now, I'll just address the last question, and it's, 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 it's related to Musar in general, as we discussed last time, how Musar is all about the small actions, the ma'asim k'tanim. The world is made up of many tiny things, Rav Rolbi discusses, in our spiritual lives, in our psychology too, and our whole well-beings are made up of, of small actions. Musar doesn't ask us to, to uh, make our days radically different, one from another. Right? In our case, if we want our days to feel different, we just need to do one small action, one small different thing every day. And if, if that's what we want, and we have to be intentional about it, it doesn't have to be anything huge. It can be making a nice cup of tea. It might mean going for a walk. It might mean meditating or praying, making a special call to someone, just, just small actions. That's all we can ask for. And as we saw in the Sefer HaChinuch, Acharei HaPe'ulot Nimshachim HaLevavot, our hearts follow our actions. And as we, as we take these small actions, we'll slowly make positive imprints on our heart, one that we hope will last as we continue these small actions and build on them over time. Okay, now we arrive today. Today's Midah, after we've done our little review of Kavod, Kavod, which we might translate as, as honor or respect. So what, are, what do these words mean? What does it mean to be honored? What, is, what do you mean to honor somebody else? Who or what should be the targets of our honor? So let's start, as we've been doing, with the very word itself. Certainly in Hebrew, and to the extent that we can learn something insightful from English too. And we'll start with the word respect, which is a common translation of kavod, even if it sounds a bit passe. It actually contains the word respect, though it's an English word, it actually contains very, very deep wisdom. And I learned this from a sermon from Rabbi Harold Schulweis, uh, where I grew up, of blessed memory, and he explains that to respect somebody, what, what's, the, what's the key to respect? We actually just have to look at the word. Respect. Re means to do something again. 
Spect is like spectacles, to look, to see. To respect is to look again. To respect someone means to take a second look, to not rush to judgment, to not bear a grudge, to be willing to look at a person anew, to see something that's deeper, what's more than what's on the surface. That's one important thing to think about respect in Kavod. It's about really trying to see below the surface, to look again and not just come to you know, very fast judgments without really checking those. If you can think about somebody in your life who maybe you're friends with now, who you maybe didn't like in the beginning so much, um, happens to us all. Um, maybe we developed that relationship because we looked again. And that's something that we're challenged to do all the time um, is to look again, look again, look again, find the good. And we're gonna talk about that shortly. We often translate, as I mentioned, the midah of kavod is honor or respect. Um, and the word kavod, kavod, honor or respect in the Jewish tradition is associated with a lot of different things. Uh, many, 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 many different things. What are all the things we could honor? There is the idea of kavod habriot, literally the honor of the creations, the honor of all, in this case, human beings, and actually how the honor of human beings is sometimes even more powerful, takes priority over certain ritual obligations, certain rabbinic um, ordinances. If, it, if it's between doing a rabbinic ordinance or violating a rabbinic ordinance and actually honoring somebody, the sages say we should honor that person, kabod habriot, literally honoring all creations. We have uh, we have kabod hamit, which maybe is a subsection of kabod habriot, which is honoring the dead. Right? We need to make sure that people have dignified burials, that they're buried quickly, not left out overnight. We have kavod hatora, right? Treating the Torah as something imbued with holiness. We have kavod hatzibur, uh, respecting the community, respecting the time, the norms, the spaces of our communities. Kavod Harav, if you've ever heard that expression, respect for the rabbi, honor for the rabbi, for the teacher, treating our spiritual leaders with a certain level of relevance. There's Kavod Hamalchut, respecting the government, that's an important one um, and a difficult one. And of course, Kibud Ave'em, respecting our parents um, is a great mitzvah as well. Maybe you think of also Kavod Shabbat, honoring Shabbat. There's so many things, things and people that we honor in in the Jewish tradition. Some of these are people, others are things and entities, which is not a surprise given our exploration of Musar often includes treating objects in a certain way that we would ideally treat each other. Um, one, one, way, one, one, way, one form of kavod I heard about was, was honoring the challah at the table. There's a common explanation that, that we cover the challah Friday night. Um, why? Because we don't want to embarrass the challah while we're making kiddush. There's actually a technical legal reason why we cover it, but let's go with this reason that we don't want to embarrass the challah. We don't want to embarrass the challah. And the way one of Rav Wolby's grandchildren uh, expresses it is, is uh, if we wouldn't embarrass the challah, or actually I think he was quoting a story from the Chafetz Chaim, um, if, we won't, uh, if, we're, if we're so careful about embarrassing the challah, we should be very careful about embarrassing each other, right? So the way we, if, if, we're, right, if, we're, if we're so sensitive to this thing, this piece of bread, then like obviously with fellow human beings, we should be very, very, very careful with honor. So what do all of these forms of honor have in common? What are, what, what are some of the common denominators or what's sort of the organizing principle behind kavod? Of course, we should look at the word as always. The word kavod literally, it comes from the root of kaved. Kaved, it literally means heavy or weight. We're translating kavod as honor, but it's associated with heaviness of weightiness. And what this suggests is that when we treat someone with kavod, we are treating them as if, and this is, these are really the two, only two words we really need to take away from today, we're treating them as if they matter. We are saying, you matter, you are of matter, you matter, you weigh something, right? You're not just something floating away without much value. No, you weigh something, you mean something. They're to be taken seriously. It's as if we're looking at these people, and this applies to ourselves as well, as if they make a mark in this world. When we act with others, or in holy spaces with what's called in Hebrew, kovet rosh, kovet rosh, literally uh, a heavy head or an honorable head, right? We are comporting ourselves in a way that we're telling the other person or the space we're in that we're taking it seriously. Someone who's joking around in shul, they're not expressing kovet rosh. If someone is there standing in a dignified way, not talking out of turn, et cetera, that's kovet rosh, right? That's a form of honoring. I'm saying where I am, is a special place. This place matters. 
It makes a, it calls me to do something. And this weightiness isn't just of the person being honored, but of the act itself. It's heavy. It's hard to carry. It's hard to honor somebody. It demands a lot of effort and exertion to look again, to look again and, 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 and challenge our judgments, right? Or to really see the good in somebody else, to praise somebody else. It's not easy to really put someone else's honor at the same level or even above our own honor or our own religious obligations. It's not easy stuff. It's kaved. It's heavy. It's hard stuff. And the opposite of the word kavod is uh, for the root for kavod or kaved is kal. Kal, which means light or easy. The word kal in the tradition is oftentimes associated with the opposite of kavod rosh. It's kalut rosh or levity. When we interact with others or, or behave in spaces with a sense of carelessness or lack of awareness or of the holy spaces or people we're interacting with, Right? Not coincidentally, this word call, it means easy. It's, the, it's, it's also the, word, the root word for klala, which is a curse. Klala is a curse. So when we treat somebody lightly, when we treat them with kalut, it's as if they don't weigh anything. When we don't take them seriously, it's as if, and it can feel that way, as if we're cursing them. If somebody says, you don't matter, it's as if I'm a curse. What, so what good am I? Right? We're treating them with klala, and our goal is to treat them with with kavod, with honor, with weightiness. And as the notion of heaviness suggests that the act itself is difficult, we learn here that to disrespect someone, to bring them down or ourselves down is so much easier than lifting someone else or ourselves up. As a lot of psychologists say, losses loom larger than gains. Negative points stick out much more easily than positive points. It's much easier to walk into a room and make note of all the things that are wrong about somebody or the space than to actually say, oh, here are all the things that are going well. One is, very, one is much easier than the other. The above applies to what we've just said, what we've all said, applies to ourselves and demonstrating a sense of self-respect or dignity. Sit up straight, don't, you know, don't look like a schlub, right? The sages of old explain that when we don't hold ourselves high up, literally and figuratively, we are not demonstrating kavod for ourselves. And we could debate this, right? Like the sages talk about not eating in the market. If you eat in the market, you're like a dog and you're not allowed to testify in court. Maybe they had different norms back then. We could investigate that. Um, but one thing is clear about kavod is that it is relative. And Rav Wolby explains that there's no set curriculum for developing the, the midah of kavod um, because everybody is different. Everybody experiences honor in a different way and everybody has different needs. Um, but the way that the tradition expresses it in, is in a very physical way. Right, that the way that we physically present ourselves uh, highlights something that's more internal, something deeper. Um, and when we honor ourselves, that is really a, a prerequisite for honoring others, which, which we'll talk about soon. Um, in, in rabbinical school, I remember the thing that, that one of the things I disliked most, I disliked a few things, not all too many, but one of the things was when uh, they, would, they would tell us, I think, never go outside wearing a white t shirt or don't wear jeans and, and tennis shoes, something like that. And I'm somebody who likes white shirts. I, you know, I like wearing gym clothes. I like wearing flat brimmed hats. Um, it's kind of just what I feel comfortable with. It also does give me a sense of anonymity, which I appreciate. Um, but oftentimes from an outsider's perspective, if they're looking at me as a rabbi, that might show a lack of self-respect, right? A lack of respect for the role that I hold. It's important to think about that too. I struggle with it, but I get it. So in regarding self-respect, my, my chavruta, uh, David Schwartz pointed out a uh, one comment on a on a on a commentary from the parsha from last week, and and it's connected to the words of uh, kavod and call, and it, and he says and it's it's like this. So in Leviticus twenty one nine, the Torah warns of the kohens, the priests. It says, do not engage in harlotry, some sort of sexual promiscuity. If they do, they will be burned to death in the Torah. And the verse uses the verb profane which is chet lamed, chal, to describe engaging in harlotry. This word chal, profane, like to be mechalel Shabbat, to profane the Sabbath, to break Shabbat, that's described, engage, that's the word that's used, in, that's used in describing harlotry. And it says that, that the person has profaned her father, chalal. And the commentary suggests that the origin of this word, chal, or to profane, is actually the same as kal, with the kuf, we said, which was easy. So instead of profane, this suggests that 
that engaging in an harlotry is light, it's kal, right? And the daughter in this case is not treating herself with the respect that she deserves. And her action literally curses, kalal, we talked about this word kalala, curses her father. And this understanding suggests that some of the social ills may relate to a lack of self-esteem, perhaps a lack of self kavod and, and my friend David concludes, may we each treat ourselves and others with the respect that someone created in the image of God deserves. So our goal with the Midah of Kavod is to treat people as if they matter, to honor the dignity within each person, to honor the dignity within each person, right? Who says we matter though? Well, the Torah says we matter. We have a Tzalem Elohim. We have this little image of God within every one of us. I'm sure you've heard this teaching from Rav Shmuley, or you've learned it yourself on your own. And we're not going to get into the details of what Tzalem Elohim, the image of God, means, because as one of my teachers says, if we try to, to define what Tzalem Elohim is, we're probably going to find a lot of people who don't have it. And that's not a good thing. Not a good thing to, to make that our mission is to find people who don't have it. Right? And so then they're going to be excluded from this whole conversation. We don't want to go there. Suffice to say that God is infinite. And perhaps then the Tzalem Elohim, this holy neshama, this soul, this image of God, that too is infinite, infinitely weighty and infinitely present. And as I mentioned at the beginning, there are many things that we, that we direct our kavod towards in Judaism. We're challenged to treat as much of this world with kavod right, as possible. First and foremost, though, we must see ourselves as if we matter. That's the first step. We have to see ourselves as, as if we matter. We say in our prayers, quoting from the book of Isaiah, Kadosh, 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 Hashem Svakot, Melok Cholalarz Kevodo, that holy, 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 the tippy toe prayer, my favorite, right? We go up on the tippy toes, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole world is filled with God's Kavod, Melok Cholalarz Kevodo. And so, how do we find the holiness that is God's? Where is it revealed? through God's honor, which, which fills the whole world. God's honor is within all of creation, ourselves included. And in this way, many say that we must love ourselves right before we're truly able to love others. So we must recognize the kavod, our own significance before honoring others. If we really dislike ourselves, if we don't feel like we matter, how can we possibly avoid seeing the world through non-cynical eyes? Like, I just think that's the reality. And as Rabbeinu Yona, who's a very famous commentator from the 13th century, let's find this quote. Rabbeinu Yona says the following. He says, the first opening for spiritual growth is that a person knows their own worth and recognizes their strengths and the strengths of their ancestors. This is positive Musar. This is positive affirmations recognizing the nikudot tovot, the good points within each and every one of us, right? Once I recognize the significance and the merits of myself and hold myself to that standard, I can treat others similarly. And Rabbeinu Yonah reminds us of the importance of knowing our own significance vis-a-vis -vis our spiritual growth to reflect others' intrinsic value. We must first know our own worth. And this is connected to our inherent significance to being a creation of God, but also to my ancestors and my lineage. It's a little funky that he brings that here about what did my ancestors have to do with anything? I would say a lot of people have put in a lot of work and pain for me to be here today through the generations. Think of many, 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 many generations, right? That have put in the work and effort and pain and birth pangs, right? And joy, of course, to, to bringing you here today. This didn't just happen overnight. A lot of people put in work for this. And though not all parents are created equal, on the whole, parents sacrifice a lot for their children to succeed out of love. And by recognizing the love that God has for me in creating me and the love that my ancestors, whether they knew it or not, have for me in creating me, I can make strides towards appreciating my own worth. It helps me feel grounded as if I belong here. I matter and I belong in this sort of history of humanity of the world. So we ought to see ourselves as if we matter, as if we have dignity, which we do, that we ourselves need to honor that dignity in, wh in which we feel uh, is, is, uh, is worthy of honor as well. But like gratitude, which flows outward, the dignity to see 
uh, in ourselves, the dignity that we should see in ourselves should also flow outwards towards honoring the dignity in others as well. Seeing others as if they too matter, as if there's something unique and holy within them as well. I'm not sure which one's harder, to be honest with you. Um, but at least as far as Musar is concerned, um, it does suggest that, that we start with ourselves. Um, although I wouldn't say that's necessarily how it has to be. Right? And this brings us to a fundamental principle, a fundamental teaching of Benzoma. If you remember Benzoma in Pirkei Avot, chapter four, Mishnah one, he's a friend of ours. He told us a few weeks ago that the wise one is the one who learns from everyone. The rich one is the one who's happiest with their lot. We saw that with gratitude. The strong one is the one who combats and overcomes their urges, perhaps the urge to stay passive and still. Maybe that's relevant for his result. And this time, Benzoma is teaching us about honor, about kavot. Who is the honored one? Not the one who honors themselves, but the one who honors others. How does honoring others suggest that I am the honorable one? It's a beautiful teaching by the Slonim Rebbe, 20th century, the author of a very popular work called Mitivot Shalom. And the way that he expresses it is as follows. He says, when the Mishnah asks, who is dignified? It does not mean who is made dignified by other people, as is the common understanding. What value is there in being dependent on other people giving you dignity? Rather, who is dignified? One who gives dignity to all people is teaching that the gaze of one person to another is like glancing in the mirror. If the face is dirty, he will see or they will see in the mirror a dirty face. So it is the same when a person looks at the other. The amount that they are pure and refined internally, so they will look more generously upon the other and see good attributes. On the other hand, if they're infected with bad attributes and behaviors, so they will see bad attributes in everyone else. Therefore, the truly dignified person is the one who treats all people with dignity, who appreciates all people. This behavior is the true sign that they are dignified themselves. In other words, the good that we see in others reflects the good in ourselves and the bad we see in others reflects the bad that is in ourselves. And this is a common lesson that many of us might've heard before from parents and therapists, but the Slonim Rebbe is, is telling us this in the context of our own Mishnah. There's a, a rabbinic expression that kol aposel that the one who says to somebody else, you're no good, you're disqualified. I'm disqualifying them through my own uh, my own blemishes. It's because of my own blemish that I'm disqualifying somebody else. When we find ourselves looking askance at others, Benzoma and the Sloan Marebi are telling us that we really need to take a step back and really focus on step one, that we need to develop kavod for ourselves. We have to look, right now we should be looking, if we see ourselves looking badly at somebody else um, or with a negative attitude or, or judging them harshly, that means that we need to take a pause, stop looking at them and instead look inside. Don't look outside right now. It's as if we're looking at the world through dirty glasses and we see a dirty world as a result, right? We're anxious, we're insecure. We feel the need to judge others poorly to give ourselves a step up. Our own need for honor is our downfall here, right? We need to clean off our dirty glasses, work on ourselves and our flaws and biases so we can then see the world clearly, I would say through God's eyes, as it were. And when we realize that we are seeing the world with rosier colored glasses, not rose colored glasses, but rosier colored glasses, seeing divinity and beauty in others, feeling sensitivity towards them, celebrating in their successes rather than harping on why it's not mine. Right? At that point, we'll be able to, uh, uh, I think, recognize that we've arrived at a new level of dignity and honor. When we feel ourselves judging others negatively, not seeing their tzalem elokim, we need to take a moment, recognize what we're doing. Ask, notice what we're thinking. Forgive ourselves for doing that. Don't like beat ourselves up when we find ourselves doing that. Just recognize that we're doing it. Say, okay, you know, we all do it. It happens. I'm not feeling great. So I'm, I'm you know, taking it out on somebody else right now. It's okay. And then we should ask ourselves, why are we doing it? Are we seeing their holy soul? Are we seeing their tzalem elokim, their holy image of God? If we're not, just look at the person and try and find it. You might even come to select the person a little bit more. Judy, yes, I see your hand is up. Is this a counterweight to the requirement that we admonish other people? 
because I think a lot of people get value in knowing more technicalities and, and condemning other people as not being good enough Jews. So th this, um, this really seems to me as is saying to us, start seeing the good in them. Start, d don't, don't be picky. Let them be picky on their own behalf. Mm. Um, if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, like you're pointing out that here we're, we're suggesting that when we see something wrong, I'm saying when we see something wrong, look inside, there is a common practice indeed a mitzvah that when we see something wrong to call that person out or to, to change their behavior, right? So there is a tension here. You're right. You're right. And I think that this, this idea of tochecha of rebuke still applies. The question is, where is it coming from? And am I doing it perhaps out of love? Am I doing it out of anger? Um, I would say doing it out of love is probably a, a healthier choice here. Um, but if, I, if, I, if I'm giving tochecha and, it, and I realize that while I'm giving tochecha, I'm not seeing the humanity in this person, I would say maybe it's time for me to take a break and not give that tochecha right now until I see this person maybe as, as somebody with a story, right? As someone with a story, as someone who is capable of change, who means well, um, who wants to be in conversation with me. Of course, we're not supposed to give tochecha if we don't think they're going to respond to us necessarily. Um, but it, it, is an important, um, it is an important challenge or tension. I'll also say that, that, there, are, that often, there are laws actually, very in-depth laws about when we're supposed to rebuke somebody. Um, and what happens when my rebuke is going to embarrass them? I think we can talk about so-called uh, call-out culture uh, these days. What happens when, when I call somebody out publicly right, and embarrass them? Right? I've, they've done something wrong. And I'm going to say they've done something wrong. I'm not going to question that. But what should my, my goal be here? And there are opinions that, that suggest that, that you know, if we see somebody wearing uh, wool and linen on a rabbinic level, for example, wool and linen, which is a, which is a uh, prohibited by the Torah, but like if there's it's, it's a, a different kind of wool and linen that's not as serious, but it's still prohibited. If we see them walking around like that publicly, should we tell them, hey, you're wearing wool and linen and they have to take it off immediately? No, we're concerned for their honor. We don't want to embarrass them. So we just let it go, right? So there is, I think, a balance here of like when we're, when we're calling somebody out or giving tochacha, are we doing it in the way that is still maintaining their dignity and their honor? Is that helpful, Judy? Rabbi? Okay. Yes, please, Randy. What, what about people who are anti-Semitic, I mean, who bash Israel, who bash Jews? I mean, it's like people who, whether they're ignorant or whether they're evil, I mean, what about that? Yeah, I think, um, I think, I think, I think those, those are real questions. Um, and those are the hard questions, right? When we talk about the goodness in the world, like we can also say, well, if everybody has the image of God, well, like, what about, you know, Adolf, you know, exactly. uh, may his name be obliterated, uh, you know, to some extent, right? Like what, like, like those are, those are the hard questions. And I would say, honestly, I don't think, I don't think every anti-Semite is the same. I don't think every person who's anti-Israel, which is, I would not say is the same as anti-Semitism. I don't, they're not all the same. They all come from different, like some people just have like a lot of hate in their heart. Some people have had really negative experiences, right? I think we need to take care of ourselves physically. Like that's, there's no, there's no, you know, no, no compromising on physical uh, safety. Um, but as somebody who's done work in, in uh, you know, in jails, and I've worked with people who have, who have blood on their hands, right? And they're not all the same. They're just not all the same. And, and everybody has a story. Everybody has a situation. And yeah, um, that, that's, I think what I could say to that. Um, but I do think that even when people are anti-Semitic or, or don't like Israel, and, and, and if that offends us, um, they're still human beings, right? And they're still valued. Um, and they're still, everyone's capable of teshuva at some point. Am I the one who needs to make them do teshuva or inspire them? Maybe not. I don't know. That, that's, that's sort of our, our own individual calls to make. Um, but I would say like for 99% of the people that we're going to interact with, I would say this is what these teachings apply to. Um, and it's really hard to apply these teachings in the same way when we feel like we're, we're threatened, when we feel like we don't have the power. And I'm, and I'm actually going to address that explicitly in a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Ah, so where were we? Um, all right, well, when we don't, let's see, when we don't treat ourselves um, or others in the world with kavod, right? We can think of what happens, right? 
when we don't treat, when we don't think that people matter, right? The, we have wars, we have violence, racism, exploitation, poverty, anti-Semitism, we can add to that list, right? Climate change, deforestation, endangered species, the list goes on. When we feel like we individuals or humans are the only ones that matter, we are the ones with the weight on this earth, we end up destroying the world. We end up destroying ourselves. So we should ask ourselves, do we ever feel ourselves belittling others, treating fellow humans as something less than human, taking workers for granted? When we do that, we are bringing ourselves down too. Think of someone you feel is not really worthy of so much kavod. Are those people we look down upon really so different from us? Do they not come from a mother at some point? Will they not end up in the ground at some point? Right? We're all unique and, we are all the, and we are, we're all unique and we're all the same. And kavod tells us to check ourselves, see that when we honor others, right? not only is that an end in itself, but it helps remind us that we too are honored. I'm wondering if we can imagine a world, imagine a world where we all looked at one another as if we mattered, as if our fates were bound up with one another. In other words, where we all gave each other kavod, I think that would be an amazing world. Perhaps it's an ideal world, but I do think it would be an amazing world. It's just so striking that we treat a car worth say $100,000 more with more care than we do our own bodies or each other, which are infinitely valuable. Right? This might seem irrational on some level, but it actually makes a lot of sense. The supply of humans, the supply of humans is so great. The supply of humans is so great. We interact with humans all the time. We're used to seeing one another such that we don't see the beauty in each other that we probably should. We probably give kavod more to those we actually see less often because we see them less often. We dress up, we ask more questions. How are you? Tell me everything. I want to hear so much to catch up on. Right? We show up on time for them. We're extra you know, expressive with our appreciation. It's a special occasion when I see somebody I don't see often. It's not every day. And yet the closest people in our lives, our family, friends, partners, work colleagues, because we see them every day, it's like no big deal. The ways we honor, we usually honor others falls to the wayside. It's the difference between walking into a room after a long day and greeting someone with a smile and asking how their day was and heading to the couch or just going straight to your room and you know, not taking much of an interest. I think of roommates, how in the beginning, there's this honeymoon period. Every day is an event to catch up on. Oh, tell me about work and all this. And then eventually things become more routine. Conversation maybe gets stale, right? There's a little bit less of a heart-to-heart -heart relationship. I'm sure people in marriages, this is a similar, uh, similar discussion. Um, and a side note, by the way, it's why I love Shabbat. This is why I love Shabbat. It's a time for my roommate and me to actually be present and talk to each other. We might observe Shabbat in different ways but there aren't any distractions. We make each other fancy food. We make the table nice. It's a special occasion, even if we see each other every day. And this is an expression of kavod Shabbat. The honoring of Shabbat actually helps us set the stage to honor each other. I think it's a beautiful thing how, how the kavods are actually all connected. When I honor Shabbat, that helps me prepare to honor, um, honor somebody else. And kavod is not merely thinking this way, just like gratitude. It's not only feeling grateful for something and Musar, there has to be action, right? Thinking is nice. Better we think people are worthy and full of dignity than not. But if we don't live that out in reality, as we saw last week with Zrizud, the dignity remi remains covered. It's covered, it's hidden. It's not seeing the light of day. You can think of all the people in their lives who have had you know, terrible situations of abuse where they were told they didn't matter. Where's that Selah Melokim? A lot of times they don't see it. It's been covered up. It's been covered up. We need to treat our others and ourselves with maximum dignity. Um, the way that Rav Wolbe explains it is the external behavior of kavod helps bring out the internal essence of the holy Tzela Melokim. Right? This goes for others. This goes for ourselves. And to highlight this, let's return to Rabbi Akiva. Before we go into some practical tips, let's, let's return to Rabbi Akiva, who we spoke about in the beginning. Right? The reason why the plague struck was because his students um, they were, they were quote, shalo nahagu kavod ze baze, because they did not behave with honor towards one another. Rabbi Akiva's 12,000 pairs of students did not, uh, behave with each other with honor. Shalo nahagu kavod ze baze. Had we not been in the context of Musar, we might think, okay, they didn't respect or honor each other. Fine. So the lesson of the, you know, lesson of the stories, respect each other. Easy enough. 
But now that we've been looking at kavod, we might interpret this in a new way. First of all, we might say that they did not treat the others as if they mattered. This could actually help us make sense of the plague that hit. What, oh, you didn't respect each other, so all of a sudden, you know, there's a plague? What, where, where's, the, where's the justice in that? Okay, so the students are saying to one another, or, or okay, God is suggesting, perhaps, you don't think the other person matters? Well, wait until everyone is dying. And you might just gain a new perspective on life, right? And on the other person. Sometimes the loss of someone, in this case, a fellow chavruta, reminds us how heavy, how significant they really are in general and in our lives. And unfortunately, with Rabbi Kiva, it took a tragic plague to remind them of that reality. I can think of a lot of tragedies that happened. I remember after September 11th, there was so much unity, so much unity. We all matter. We're all one. Right? Sometimes tragedy brings people together and reminds us that we all matter. And second, in Musar, as we just said, we need to act. We can't just feel. So it's possible that actually the students did feel that the others mattered, that they were significant. But Shalom Nahagu, they did not externally express that they felt that way. They might have felt what they felt. They may have adopted Rabbi Kiva's advice and loved you know, their neighbor as themselves. But they interpreted that love internally. They might have loved, but did they show that love? They did see each other as worthy of honor, but did they actually honor them indeed? That perhaps is, is, the, is the main sin of the students. Not, it could be that they, that they didn't see each other as, as if they mattered, but perhaps they did, but they didn't make it known. They didn't make it known. What are a few examples from our contemporary times when we don't show kavod to one another? I mean, I'm, I could probably just open up to the floor, but we could talk about worker exploitation, right? Worker exploitation. Uh, my favorite example, or not my favorite example, but, but um, you know, people asking for, for money on the streets or support on the streets, right? How often do you see people just look away, ignore, don't say anything? It's very uncomfortable. And we said, kavod is not easy. Kavod is kaved. It's heavy. It's hard. Um, but what would it be like to live in a world, and, and, and halacha, the Jewish law expresses this idea as well, that when somebody asks us for money, we do not look away. Do not look away. It's a very small thing. It's hard, but it's a small action. We're not saying you have to give money or food, although some people would probably say that. I would say kavod. Give kavod. If I can't give money or I don't want to give money or food, I can give kavod. And how can I do that? With a smile. I can give a smile. Is that so hard? I can give a smile. I can say, I'm sorry. I can say, God bless you. Good luck. I wish you well. Right? We don't have to be their best friend. Don't have to invite them over for Shabbos dinner. Right? But just to give somebody who's asking for money, who's probably in like the least kavod state, where they feel like, no, we really don't matter. Kavod. Say you matter. Smile. Acknowledge their presence. That's one very practical step, I would say. Um, of course, paying someone a living wage is a bit more complicated, but like when I pay somebody a living wage, I'm saying you matter, your life matters. It's not just about me making a profit, right? Um, and what happens when I'm not in a position of power? Right? We spoke about this a little bit, right? What if I'm looking at people in power or, or hateful people, people don't, who aren't appreciating me, they don't see my holy image. Hey, what about me? I, and I said, I, I don't have a great answer or suggestion except to say, that, you know, barring egregious behavior and trauma, those people too, yeah, they're humans. They have a Tzalem Elohim. And I might not understand it, but I know it's there. They're also infinitely valuable. They're humans. And that Tzalem may be covered up. Perhaps it is. Maybe there's some foreign influence or value system that's driving their behavior. But the Tzalem is there. The dignity is there. And it might not be our jobs to reveal it. But it is part of Musar practice, at least to recognize that it's there that there's possibility. And far be it for me to tell someone with less power opportunities to see someone else who might be making their situation worse, right? I can only say that when we take the image of God away from one person, right? When we do that, it, it leads to mistreatment and oppression of others at one point or another, and who knows you know, when that will rise. Okay, where does this leave us? Well, first of all, there's a lot more to kavod. We haven't even touched it. What are the dangers of kavod? The dangers of honor? What happens when we actively seek it out? We're not going to get there, but certainly there's a time to discuss that. Uh, we spoke about kavod versus kal, like the heavy versus the lightness. 
We talked about the first step of cover, which is to recognize the honor within myself, to give myself dignity, to hold myself up uh, to a certain standard, right? And when I'm sort of seeing you know, myself clearly as, as, as through God's eyes, I can look clearly at other people as well. We talked about Selah Melokim, this non-negotiable thing, which is inside of each and every one of us. We remind ourselves that Musar is about action, right? We have to show honor. We have to unlock the Selah Melokim and allow it to shine. We saw Rabbi Akiva's students did not do that. They may have respected one another or felt the other person was worthy of respect, some, some texts say they hated each other. We're not going to go with that reading. But they didn't show the respect for one another. They didn't show the honor. They didn't look again. They didn't show the other person that they mattered. They were learning together every day. It's like, again, you know, if you're learning together every day for many years, things, you know, the honeymoon period is over, right? It's, everything's normal. We need to refresh. And we saw the beautiful idea that Kavod Shabbat can actually um, bring people together and high at the Kavod and one another. So as we look ahead, what are some concrete steps before we open it up? What are some concrete steps that we can take to show Kavod? And um, I hope that at least one of these will speak to, to some of us. I'm happy to hear your feedback. So what are some concrete things we can do? One, we can set intentions once a day that we will try to see the world with an ayin tova, a good eye, that will see the best in other people and give them the benefit of the doubt just once a day or one person a day. Right? And this applies to myself too. Am I giving myself the benefit of the doubt? Am I seeing the good in myself? Right? Do an active kavod for yourself. Right? This is the ayin tova, the good eye. Develop a good eye, not a judgmental eye. Number two, we can take more time and give more attention to our loved ones at home when we or they come home from work. We can close our phones, actually be present for once. That is a way of honoring somebody, certainly saying that what I, you know, you in my conversation with you, you're what matters right now, not whatever is going on here. Rav Aaron Cutler, one of the, the, the founders of the Lakewood Yeshiva, the Beit Medrash Gavoa in, in Lakewood, New Jersey, suggests that when we go to a toll booth, that we try to be the one, that we try to go to the toll booth, that's not the automated one. We should go to the one that's staffed by a human. We can say the same thing about CVS, right, in the auto checkouts. Why? Because he says, I haven't asked somebody about this, but he says, when we go to the automated ones, we're sending a message to the humans that you are replaceable. That the thing that you're doing, eh, not so hard. A computer could do it too. So maybe it costs me an extra few minutes. I don't know the, the logistics of it all, but if you, if you, I'm from Los Angeles, we don't have toll booths, we have freeways. Um, but if you do have a toll booth or an auto checkout, maybe, do a, maybe, maybe notice that like, hey, this is an opportunity for connection. Why should I do the auto checkout if I don't have to? I should go and honor the person who's there say thank you, right? They're human beings too. They're not, they're not computers. They are not replaceable. Revolvi suggests, number four, asking others for advice. The great Chazon Ish, great sage, once asked a, a yeshiva menahel, yeshiva principal manager, possibly Revolvi himself, for advice about like a shidduch, about setting somebody from the yeshiva up with somebody else for marriage. He sought the advice from this lowly principal uh, because he wanted to treat this person as an equal. When we ask people advice, as you probably know, when someone asks you for advice, it's a way of showing, I honor you, right? Your opinion matters. Number five, go the extra mile. Go the extra mile. The sages teach that our students' honor should be as honorable as our own and that, the, that, that our friends, and our friends, that, that their honor, well, yeah, that, that, our, that our students' honor should be as honorable as our own. And even if objectively that's not the case, why is it the case that we should honor our students as much as ourselves? Um, whether or not they're worth it or whether or not they are really worthy of that, that same level of honor. Why? Because a lot of times we under, we under, um, under, underperform, right? So, so the idea there is that perhaps show an extra level of kavod, an extra level uh, to people, maybe, you know, be more effusive in your thanks. And perhaps you might just hit the, hit the mark where it's supposed to be um, rather than, than underachieving. Um, number six, if you find that you're not showing sufficient honor, ask yourself, what is, what's so important at the moment that's limiting you? Are you so focused on work that you can't look up to say hello to the person who just walked into the room? Are you running late because something last minute came up? It drew your attention away? Whatever it is, as we said in the very beginning, the Talmud teaches that kavod habriot, honoring the dignity of our fellow human beings, takes precedence over rabbinic prohibitions. In other words, if I'm, on my way to shul, if I'm on my way to shul, to synagogue, and then there's someone who needs my help, 
It might just be that I should pray on my own instead and help this person right now. This person needs my help. They take precedence. Their honor matters more. They matter more. The case in the Talmud is where one comes across a dead body, a met mitzvah, where nobody else can bury them but you. And in this case, out of honor for this deceased person, we take a detour from shul. We skip the Megillah greeting on Purim and instead take care of their burial. That's how great Kavod HaBriot is and Kavod HaMate, right? And if we do that for the dead, says Rav Wolby, how much for the living? And lastly, and, and this I'll stop and then we'll open it up for, for thoughts and comments. I was asked once to teach a group of, uh, of young adults about something related to Passover. And I asked them, this is a true story. I said, well, what do you want me to teach about? And they said, ah, oh, don't worry about it. You know, it's no big deal. You know, four people, it's going to be like four people, people in our community, they don't really love Taurus. So it's just going to be four people or so like, just wing it. And I told them, listen, guys, I prepare for four, like I prepare for 400. Those four are taking time out of their busy days to come to this class. So I don't care how many people are going to be there. What kind of kavod am I showing them, right? When them being there is not enough. You know, it's like, no, it has to be in certain numbers and then it's worth my time. No, they've actually, I want to respect their time that they're taking out of their day to come here, right? The kavod lesson here, honor people's time. Do your best to show up on time. And when we're there, when we're in a meeting, if we're in a teaching and a coaching and a, in a learning, whatever we're doing, let's try to be present at least once a week, one meeting a week, maybe pick one meeting um, where you find yourself getting distracted often. And perhaps for 15 minutes of that meeting or the whole meeting, perhaps, you don't look at another, another website or you don't look at your phone, something like that, just to, just to show the person that the person I'm with right now, the person who I'm talking to, I respect them. I'm honoring them. They're here with me, right? And, and, when, and I should really, really be present with them. And so I, my, my, my hope is that we can find the strength to both honor ourselves and others. And in so doing, we can create a more chesed-filled and pleasant world to live in. Let me pause there and, uh, and let's take it from the floor. The floor is yours. Rabbi, if you have a parent who says, promise me that you'll, you will cremate me, and you've got kavod uh, abba em, and you've got kavod hamed, how, how is a person supposed to handle that kind of thing? Sorry, I don't know if it's helpful or not, but this is not the first time. I've heard this question. Yeah. I, um, that's such a hard question. It's such a hard situation to be in. Um, you know, what, one of the things we're taught in rabbinical school is, is usually to find out what's behind the question and like not answer from a, you know, a legal perspective, right? Sometimes it's easy to think, oh, well, like, is this permitted? Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer. Um, kavod, kavod habriyo, kavod uh, kibud aveim, is 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 a really important mitzvah. But so is kavod hamait. And and what is the what is our, you know, when we talk about also, again, like honor of ourselves and like the image of God, like what does that mean? And and how much ownership do we really have over our own bodies? Um, that's 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 one of the questions that oftentimes comes up in these conversations. Um, I did hear a, a rabbi answer that question. Yeah. Oh, I mean, oh, I know the answers. I know the answers, but I'm not giving them. What, what, was, what, what did you hear? Maybe this you was a, a Chabad rabbi, and this was at Lamoud mm -hmm. a few years ago, Judy. And he said that you need to honor the deceased wishes in every way except for that. And that that uh that cremation is just so um frowned upon in the Jew Jewish religion that uh you're supposed to go against his or her wishes and bury is that what you've heard Rabbi Berman I mean or do different rabbis have different opinions about that based on their beliefs 
You know, the, the rabbis understand that a lot of these decisions are not within fully our control, right? Like Judy, you might have, I don't know if you have any siblings, right? Or other, or, you know, who they, their opinions matter too. And, and if, if you are outvoted, right? Like there, I don't think there's this idea of, you know, snatch the body and, you know, bury it. Like, like, I think there is a reality of like, you only have so much control. Um, and then, but like, certainly there, you know, the rabbis have dealt with this and, and, you know, ask questions like when somebody is cremated, well, when do I start my mourning period? Um, you know, if the body's not getting buried. So like, these are real questions and like these things have happened in the past. So there's a lot of precedent, but all I can say is it's, it's, uh, it's a very difficult situation to be in um, on like so many levels. No. Yeah. And I would suggest you talk to like, talk, talk to like a spiritual, you know, guide or rabbi of yours, um, you know, privately about this and, and to see like what makes most sense for you and your family, because this is your, this is a family matter, not just, you know, your personal matter. Luckily, it's not my father, it's my husband. <laughs> oh, I thought you said parent earlier. Yes, but he has oh, children, but we have it. children. And, uh, one of my children is a Baal Teshuvah. Mm -hmm. So I, my, my response was, I, I don't have a strong feeling about how my body would be disposed and that you have to do what's right within your, um, within your belief system. And, uh, you, and I, I respect what you do and, and how you conduct yourself. So, but my my spouse still feels strongly about being cremated, so I think it'll be a, a difficult one, depending on who goes first. But I don't mean to dominate. This is this is kavod is a tough one. It is. It really is. It really is. We have a few more minutes, so so uh, we have a few more time, a few more minutes for comments. I was going to say, I think. Um... This sort of, you know, 2021, I think probably what I find sort of to be most difficult is where we talked about sort of like the kavod to self, um, because there's so many messages out there and the marketing and media and how um, people really sort of just, I mean, you look at, you know, Instagram or TikTok and how people just sort of really sort of peddle their wares, so to say, you know. And it's really hard to have any sort of real sense of um, self-respect when the messages are so countercultural or counter to what you aspire to have. Right, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the materialism of the world is, is real. Um, and actually, I didn't say this before, but the way Ravulbi actually explains it is that the world is full of, of, of things of value people's time, things, commodities. And he actually says that the, that the currency, the currency um, that we use to show, like we use money to show that we value things. We use money to show that we value things. Um, how do we show that we value one another? Because we don't pay for one another. In Sudan, they might pay for slaves to this day. Um, but how do we show that we honor each other? How do we show that we value each other? Through honor. That kavod is actually that's the currency um, that I that that's that's my currency to show that you matter um, that you val that that I value you um, that that the that it's something it's much it's much more internal um, the you know what we see outside in the media is it's very external like kavod is telling us really to dig deeper um, and to go into what's called the pnimiut the you know the inside um, that's really where the essence is. How do you deal respectively with Kavor, respectfully, with Kavor? I mean, you know, now we really need to wear masks, we need to distance. I don't know, but where you live, we, I'm in Toronto, we have to move that out there. And I could be in a, I try not to, but can you have to go to a store? And you, you, you meet someone who has no mask or a mask below the nose. And I may try by starting, I said, oh, your, your mask. You know, you probably didn't know which one to the of the river down. But when they're being like a real, they're a jerk, what can I say? 
and, and they absolutely refuse and they like get near you and, and threaten your life um, just by breathing at you. What do you do with that? Yeah, and I think it's similar maybe to Randy, Randy's question earlier. And with this, well, I think we'll, we'll close for the day until next week, which we'll talk more about. Uh, now, then we'll get to kindness and compassion, uh, which is something we can all work on. Um, yeah, I think, I think the feelings of anger and, dis- and frustration um, and even dehumanizing, you know, you know to some extent, is, 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 is natural um, and necessary even to, to make some sort of change. Um, the, just the question is, and like, I think we should still be, you know, we, we need to say like, you know, wear a mask or, or whatever the right move is there, but we can do that, right? Still, like a couple of doesn't say be nice to everybody. Doesn't, we're not saying be nice to everybody, right? But um, I am saying that, that, that but, 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 but I'm not, I bet I'm not, I'm not taking, some, I'm not seeing you as, as subhuman, Right. If there's a, there's there's been a lot of rhetoric over the last few years that you know aliens, subhuman, gross, disgusting. Right. These these are meant to evoke emotions that that make us run away, um, that make us see people as as ill. I can't be near them. Um, Kavod is trying is is trying to bring us together, um, but doesn't mean that you know doesn't mean we have to be nice. Right. And I mean, I think being nice is, is a good practice, but doesn't mean that they have to be my best friend. Um, but it does mean that I shouldn't I shouldn't bring them down to a level, you know, below where they are. Um, so, again, like, you know, you can you can stand up for what you believe in um, and you can rebuke people. The question is, how are you doing that? And what is your assumption about that person that you're talking to? That's what I would say. But yeah, low, low pashut, not simple, not simple. Um, which is why I think it's helpful to start with, start with the challah. We can honor the challah, right? And we can honor the other, the things that are easier, right? We have, again, we're, we're, we're going from like, you know, zero to 60 here. We got to start, you know, with the small actions, right? Just think of like, what's one act of kavod I can do for myself every day? What's one act of kavod I can do for somebody else, right? And we gave like, you know, eight examples, right? You know, pick one. Don't, not using your phone. That's a way of, of showing kavod. Um, you know, let's stick with, let's stick with the stuff that's hard, but not, like theologically, like, you know, the most difficult thing in the world. Like, let's start, start small. And once we get there, then, then we can move ahead. That's, that's what, that's what I would suggest as usual. Okay. Thank you all so much. I look forward to seeing you next week. If you